Hey folks, David Stewart here. Let's start the right stream up. Uh, I'm sorry for the 30 minute delay, but um, basically I have family in town and a bunch of other things going on. So that kind of impacted my ability to um, to get here on time. So I'm trying to make this happen. My sound may be a little bit off today, and that is primarily because um, I'm in a new room. The new room does not sound that good, so I'm having to use a closer mic in general um, to not get this boomy 200 hertz uh, kind of thing that's happening. I'm going, I went from like a wood paneled, um, not, no right angles room, which is what you want for recording, um, to just a, a room, just a big square box. And I think it's actually like a 10 by 10 um, little room here. So uh, going from something that's ideal for what you're doing to something that's less ideal, plus having to work out lighting and things like that um, so that I'm actually visible and, and all that kind of stuff, that's also been a little bit of an issue. Um, I don't have like a big, um, the desk I had before was this big built-in desk with all these shelves so I could attach lights everywhere um, that I wanted them to be. And in this case, I'm just working on like a plastic table and that plastic table is great for a plastic table and gives me enough workspace to actually like have my stuff out, but uh, not really as much options as far as lighting. So I'll be working on that in the next couple weeks to try to get that squared away. Uh, and there's still boxes and all kinds of other stuff everywhere. Um, so we'll be looking at fixing that. So today's right stream, um, what I kind of wanted to talk about today because I get these questions kind of a lot is the writing process, specifically my creative process or writing process, and also a little bit more about um, publishing and self-publishing. So the last stream I did a bit on self-publishing and what I really focused on was don't get duped. Don't get duped was the, the theme of that particular stream um, because I think a lot of people, you know, they hop into a new creative field or a new creative endeavor as a creative person and then when it comes time to do the business part, a lot of times things are not as obvious as they seem. And I could probably do a similar one about the music business and like the modern music business um, in particular, because that one has a lot of the same problems. Rather than there being a focus on um, matching up listeners and musicians and trying to monetize that relationship, there's a monetization of uh, the musicians themselves, meaning you're going to extract money from the musicians um, rather than try to develop an audience of listeners. Um, why that matters is because ideally you want, if you're a writer, you want to write books and then have people buy them. And that's how you, that's how you do your business. You don't want to have your business be selling services to other authors or losing all of your money in services that are supposedly necessary in order to publish um, and then hopefully reach those readers. It's the same thing in the music business. So rather than there being like editing services, there's mastering services. There's people who want to sell you mixing, you know, mixing services. There's people who want to sell you streaming stuff, want to manage all of your, um, all of your content. It's a little bit less predatory perhaps than the publishing industry, but there's still a lot of um, a lot of problems with the music industry. And in general, the music industry is far less profitable to be in. Um, and that has to do with a bunch of different factors. The fact that most people are performing with more than one person. So you're, you're always splitting your paycheck. Um, and there's less of a market for live entertainment now than ever before in history, any time that I can think of prior to this. Um, so by the time I really stopped gigging and got out of the music industry as as my bread, it's gotten worse. And so I feel good making that decision, like walking away from, from music. But let's talk a little bit about um, creative process and then I wanna to touch again on publishing and give some some overview as to how you go about um, self-publishing, what you need to, to focus on and do in order to just get a book out there and attract some readers and, and maybe get some people to pay attention and, um, and find readers that are really into what you want to write. That's the ideal. Ideally, you want to find people that are into what you're producing, not, um, not just attract anybody. 
um, because the it's better to have a, a, a reader that really likes what you're doing than it is to have 10 readers who don't like your book because they'll review it negatively. They won't buy the next book. Um, they fall out of touch, things like that. So you really want those readers who are into what you're doing. Um, so it may be attractive to say like, well, what if I sell this book to, um, to people who like teenage vampire romance novels? Well, if it's a teenage vampire romance novel and you like those readers and you want to write stories that are, are attractive to them, then you do that. But you don't try to, to attract them simply because they're large or you'll find that they don't like the work that you're producing for them. So that's just a little, a little bit there. So my creative process. Um, let's talk about that. So um, I get this question a lot. The problem with describing a creative process is it varies from person to person. So if I tell you how I go about creating a book or starting a book, um, that may be very different for you. Like you can't just say, well, I'm going to do what David Stewart does and then that'll work. It might work for you or it might not. There's no, um, there's really no guarantee that it's going to, um, that it's going to transfer for you. Um, so everybody has a little bit different way that they like to move um, into a creative endeavor. And everybody likes a little bit different part of the process. I like to talk about there's four processes to book creation. There's the planning process. There's the drafting process, revision, and finally publication. So planning is, uh, I know a lot of writers that really love to plan. They do the world building. They draw maps. They write out character sheets. They do a lot of work before they ever start writing the first word. Uh, and then the drafting process can be very smooth as a result. And then, um, you know, that essentially will save you time in drafting and a little bit with revision because you're not having to go back and fix things. I know other writers that hate to do any kind of planning. They like to just jump in and page one and start writing. That's what's exciting is that drafting process. And if it creates a little bit more work in the revision process or a lot more work in the revision process, that's the trade-off. That's okay because you're you're skipping the planning portion, which is, which is work, um, and then you're focusing more on the revision part. Um, some people really like to dial in things and do a lot of editing and revision. I've met those people. I'm not one of those that's probably my least favorite phase because it's very work intensive and I don't feel like it. Um, it's not, it's not creative to me. Creative is like the act of creation, like actually drawing the image, actually putting the words on the page. The drafting process is what's most exciting for me as well as the planning process a little bit. Um, so the revision process is far less exciting. And then I enjoy the publication process, but other people really don't like that. So what does my creative process look like? Well, it depends on which stage, I'm in and sometimes I actually move between stages which will sound uh, weird but sometimes I either commission a book cover or design a book cover before I finish the draft and I do that because I know what the draft is going to be but I also want some promotional materials that I can work on ahead of time because I think it's good to promote a little bit in advance so for example with Water of Awakening I promoted well in advance of me actually finishing the first draft and uh, well in advance of me finishing the revision phases. I had commissioned a book. I, I'd licensed an image and created a book cover with it and um, had, was able to get out there and, and promote that this, you know, that this thing was going to come out and, you know, um, check it out, get some, get some early access to it. And uh, that was a, that was a really great way to do that particular book. Other times the book's done, it's revised, and then, you know, then the cover happens. So I move between these phases depending on what interests me creatively. So before you think about a process, you kind of have to think about um, whether you want to follow your creative flow and to what degree, or you're a person that does very well on like a scheduled, on a work schedule, essentially. Um, and that varies person by person. For some people, it's too much work. It's too much like, you know, doing whatever job to have a really strict workflow. And for other people, that structure is really invigorating and, and really grounding for them and keeps them in control of what they're doing. So you have to identify what kind of person you are. I'm a more of a person that I tend to like to just do whatever I want to do. 
<laughs> and I have to rein that in a little bit because then I can get out of control skipping things or or not focusing on what I need to focus on. Uh, but that's what invigorates me the most creatively is um, switching between these different phases, doing things that are maybe slightly um, slightly out of order from what uh, other people will do. I do know writers, especially in the screenplay business, who actually write the scenes out of order. And I think there's some bigger ones that do that, including like uh, Joss Whedon. Um, you have in your mind a scene that you want to write and you just write it even though you haven't written the preceding scenes. That's actually not a bad thing to do if you're a writer uh, because you can, once you've written the critical scene, like you've written the moment that's supposed to have the big emotional impact, you can go back and you can write the scenes that really lead up to that. It's kind of like writing the ending before the beginning. Before the beginning, it it can help a little bit with planning because you know what you're building up to. Um, so really, before you start thinking about a creative process, think about what kind of person you are. I'm a person that's very energized by dynamics and change. Other people feel a lot better with things being very consistent, and I. I'm always emphasizing consistency. Like if you're just writing every single day, you're going to make it. And that really has to do with the practice that I've had as a guitarist, as a um, guitar professor and teacher uh, for like two decades, knowing how to bring students from nothing up to a presentable product. It's really all about consistency and consistent work. But as you mature a little bit, you learn, you know, you learn to do things, you learn to stretch that a little bit. So as a guitarist, um, rather than me practicing like four hours a day, every day, 365 days a year, I used to really like have very minimal practice for long periods. And then I would practice very intensely for a few weeks in order to work up a new program for that particular season. And that was what I needed creatively to be invigorated and to keep doing what I was doing. And then I could cut the practice down to just maintenance. You know, you go play a gig and you're like, man, I, you know, maybe I messed up a couple measures in this piece. You go back, you work on that during the week and make sure that uh, something hasn't, hasn't, you haven't missed something. You haven't forgotten fingerings. You play through your program and uh, it, it's kind of like a, a blast and a cruise kind of thing. Um, so it just depends on what you want to do. And some people don't write year round. Some people just write in sprints. They just write three months a year and the rest of the time they do nothing. So it depends on what invigorates you. Um, let's look and see if there's any kinds of questions here. Um, I'm sorry it's all topic, but Patreon says you're not creating content, but it's still charging me. Are they giving you the money? I hope so. They should not. I do not have a Patreon creator page, so they should not be changing you mon charging you money and you should not have... Um, you should not have anything going on and they won't be giving me any money. So I'm done with Patreon. I got rid of the page. I don't like the company. I don't like what their workflow is geared toward, which is like a two tiered system. I'd rather have everything be free and it's your option if you want to donate or if you want to buy a book or, or give me extra money. Um, I just don't like locked things. I don't like locked things because some people don't have a budget and, or sometimes budgets are really tight or you just need a lot up front before you can think about returning value. Everybody's different. And so um, I'd rather just not not bother with how Patreon does things. Just as a moral decision, I wasn't making a ton of money off Patreon. When I was making money, it was closer to like 150 bucks, which is not much, but that's easy to not have. So it's easy to lose that kind of money. And you know, it's like 1200 bucks a year, 1300 bucks a year, which is you know, that's a substantial amount of money, um, but it's nothing that I can't make up doing something else. So I'd rather do something else. So they shouldn't be charging you money. If they are, then they're just stealing your money and keeping it. So don't uh, don't let them do that. Uh, can you shed some light on Alita's story sometime? Alita, I don't know anything about that. Um, what's up? Just caught the notification. Been a little busy, but glad to catch the stream. I'll rewatch it when it's over and see what's... Okay, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, they keep, if they keep charging you, that's a problem. Um did you see Into the Spider-Verse and will you review it at some point? It is unlikely I will be able to see it. Um, there's just a lot going on uh, and I don't know who I would be able to go see it with. So if I'm going to a movie by myself, um, I'd rather go see Mortal Engines, something that I think is actually looks more creative than another iteration of Spider-Man. Um, and I just, I don't know, I probably won't see it until it comes out on video uh, unless there's just a huge amount of demand for me to go see into the spider verse. Um, okay. So let's talk about my process. So I tend to, 
not start with planning, then I, I tend to not start with planning, actually. I actually start with a little bit of drafting. And before I even start with drafting, I usually have a vision, um, a visual idea. I have a scene in mind that happens, and I can like imagine it very clearly. And that's usually what I start with is that vision. And then from there, I'll usually write the scene and work on it a little bit, and then I'll go back, and from there, I'll create a planning document. And so planning document in its initial stages is very light. It's just a series of events, big events that I want to happen, things that lead one into the other, you know, so for Water of Awakening, it would be like, you know, Helga has to go on this journey, this is why, she goes here, this happens, she goes here, this happens, she goes here, this happens. It's just a list of all the events um, that happen, the bigger, the bigger events. Um, then I start drafting. I don't even think about what characters are going to be in it other than the big ones. So I'm like, you know, here's the protagonist. Here's maybe an antagonist if there's an, if it's got an antagonist. Um, then I just start writing and I will create characters as I need to fill in, um, to fill in whatever I need. And so the cast of create, uh, cast of characters tends to come along, uh, with the book. And I think that that works out. I found that that works out technically well, because you don't want to introduce a lot of characters early in a story because the reader loses track of them. Uh, uh, there's an example from the fantasy genre, which I write in, called Malazan Book of the Fall. And you read the first book called Gardens of the Moon. It's actually quite easy to lose track of all the different um, all the different characters that are ha that are happening. Uh, in fact, there's a dram dramatis persona. There's like a, a list of characters at the back of the book for you to reference because he does everything through indirect exposition. He tells you nothing about characters. It's revealed completely through sort of witnessing their actions. And that's great, except he, re he introduces so many at the beginning of the book, you lose track of them and you forget who they are. Um, so I like to start with a smaller cast of characters at the beginning, and then we can add some in. Um, to fill that up. And there's many movies that you can look as an example for that if you're a movie watcher. Um, Star Wars starts with a smaller cast that grows. Um, you can look at, uh, say, The Matrix starts with a smaller cast that grows, um, any of those popular movies. So that tends to work out well for me. And so as I, as I am writing characters, then I go back to the planning document. I'll write in the name of the character so I don't forget it, essentially. What they are, who they, who they are, and what they do, and their relationship to whatever other characters. And it's really brief and that's it. Everything else is just kind of contained in my mind. Um, I don't like to have a lot of stuff on paper um, unless I feel like I'm gonna lose track of every little thing. Um, some people do things completely different from that. And so anyway, once I have that, I that's how I go through the draft. Um, so the planning document is being updated as I do the drafting. The main thing I wanna make sure I have well planned in advance is the main characters that are there and what they're like. Um, I want to have the plot worked out ahead of time, especially where the plot's going and what's happening at the end of the book. Um, then I like to make sure that I have my setting, the essential parts of my setting worked out. Now, uh, setting is like the baseline of that pyramid, but it's the part that I work on probably the least prior to drafting compared to other fantasy authors that work on that the most. Like I said, there's guys who draw maps, they write out every little detail of their universe before they start drafting. To me, that's inefficient. Partly, I have the big stuff worked out, like magic systems and, and stuff like that. But I don't work on the geography because I need the geography to work with the story rather than the story matching the geography. What matters is the plot to me. And, uh, and the characters and how they develop. So if I want to add mountains for them to cross, I'll add mountains and draw the map towards the end of the process rather than like have a big map and then where are they going to go in there and, and how are you going to, how are you going to fit that? It becomes more complicated as you write more books in a series or that take place in a similar geographic location. But one of the things I'm doing with the um, Eternal Dream series, which is Needle Ash and, and Water of Awakening, is um, I'm continuing to put things in, in new geographic locations that are interesting to the reader and also don't make me have to tread old ground or adhere to too strictly to old things that I've set up. Um, and that's I know that that's a little bit of a breaking of the veil. That's like, how do you not th think in detail of all these things? But for me, it's all about the story. 
and the, the things like geography don't matter quite as much. And so I just put in the things that the story needs and that's how it works. And that's actually one of the great things if you guys are writing space opera um, or, you know, or space travel science fiction. What is great about something like Star Trek is that you have a different planet every week and you don't have to adhere to any kind of limits with that. So it's like this week we're going to this planet where everybody is like beautiful and young and there's no crime, but if you do if you do break a rule you get killed, right? So that kind of stuff lets you do something new every week. Um, if you're doing something like if you look at Star Wars, you just go to a different planet and no one ever thinks about how far away the planets are from each other until somebody doesn't understand physics when they make a movie like in Force Awakens and you have Han Solo looking up and seeing like planets exploding that are nowhere near him, you know, that are many light years away, <laughs> put it that way. But um, that's the great thing about space opera is that you can you can just have things as you need them. Um, and it's a great thing about something like Star Trek. You just put in the planets that you need. You don't have to adhere too strongly to anything. It's about exp exploring new things. So whatever kind of cool story you want, whatever the story needs, you just can put that in and not worry too much about the world building part. Um, Move the mic, please. You can't hear. All right. So some people said the mic was fine. Um, I can actually turn the mic up quite a bit. So it's not a big deal. Um, let me check some questions before I get more into this. I've heard that Mortal Engines was actually handled terribly and the concept was wasted. Uh, I, I, If I see it, I will make that determination for myself. Um, I am a big fan of creativity. So this is one of the things that I like about stuff from Japan, whether it's games or it's manga or it's anime. They're always really creative. They do wacky things, and a lot of them are stupid. But I just got to give them credit for doing it. So like if they, I don't remember what I was, I was watching some weird anime where like instead of having an ocean of water, they had an ocean of sand. And I actually remember that from like Final Fantasy XII. And you're like, well, that's a cool idea, except it's stupid and, and actually wouldn't work, like, you know, with physics. But it's just a, it's just a creative thing to turn on its head, like, you know, uh, an ocean that's not water, but something else. Um, they tend to do, Japanese stuff tends to do really off-the-wall creative things and just, it's like they take more creative risks than American media. And you wouldn't think that because Americans live in a much more open culture. But I think, I don't know, I don't know why exactly that is, but I think it might have to do with um, a smaller market in Japan and freer use of money. So if you have a big market and uh, you really have to capture a certain amount of money to make, a, to make a profit, particularly with movies, you really have to appeal to the lowest common denominator to make a $200 million movie. But if you're making you know, a really cheap movie, a couple million bucks, and it just has to do well in Japan and Japan has a big culture that, it, that wants creativity, then it's easy to just take chances. And if you lose, you don't lose big. Um, and that's one of the things that used to happen in American movies is there used to be lots of little one, $2 million movies that would come out all the time, and some of them would explode and make a bunch of money, um, and other ones would just be forgotten and go into the dust. Uh, but it was an opportunity for like risk versus big reward. Now you look at the more money they spend with movies, the more they hedge their bets. They're like, they're not going to make a movie unless it's an established intellectual property, unless they have certain big name actors that are ready to go for it. All those things have to be in order. So I'm a big fan of creativity. Um, and so when I look at Mortal Engines, I'm like, well, that looks like something that's actually not um, not incredibly boring. Uh, that's not the same thing I've seen over and over again in terms of world building. Um, the same you know, variation of, of some fantasy setting or the same superhero setting, um, superhero story kind of stuff, something new and different. Uh, so even if it's done badly, my thing would be, and this is a, kind of my expectations, I expect to not like Mortal Engines when I see it. But I also have this feeling that if Mortal Engines were an anime, people would be more into it. They'd be more forgiving of its flaws simply because there's a different set of expectations for something coming from Japan, mainly that they're going to do something really creative and there's probably going to be a bunch of little misses in terms of execution because of that risk and because it's coming from something that's smaller and all that kind of stuff but when you have peter jackson 
Although Peter Jackson, when you think about it, hasn't hasn't done a great movie in quite a while. Um, you have Peter Jackson, a lot of money behind it. You're expecting something to really to really blow you away. And so, if it's even a little bit off with the with the execution, you can judge it down. And if it's a lot off with the execution, which it seems like Mortal Engines might be, then it's going to seem like a terrible movie rather than um, just merely a mediocre or you know okay okayish movie. Um, that's why I use that that system that breaks everything down and looks at everything separately because it's really easy to lose track of what something does well when it does when there's something that's done poorly. Um, so if there's like one actor or character that's really annoying, it's really easy to say, well, this movie is like a two out of 10. It's like, is it, or are there lots of other things that are good? And there's just one thing that was particularly bad to annoy you because you need to recognize the good as well as the bad. Otherwise you're not, um, you know, otherwise you're not, you're not taking in the whole thing. Will I team up with rewind again sometime in the future? It, it really depends I tend to work at weird times. Um, it's kind of hard for me to hook up with other people, but I, I mean, I try to do, um, I try to do collaborations with other people that are fun and it was a lot of fun, uh, doing a, doing a stream with him. So, um, I remember Tolkien saying to always make the map first because it was impossible to do later on. Nope. I disagree. I always make the map last, you know, um, but I already make it as I go. Um, but Tolkien had a different approach to world building. Tolkien built the world and then inhabited it. And I build a story and then will morph the world to fit what I want the story to do. Um, have you ever tried to create your own language systems for your characters, groups, and races in your stories? Not really, other than doing variations of Latin. Um, because there's so many different romance languages and Latin is such a classic language. It's really easy to create words out of Latin or create words out of Old Norse. Um, so my idea of language creation would be, you know, you take names from older languages. That makes sense. Um, for Prophet of the God Seed, I just made up gibberish. I just imagined like Klingon and they spoke that. Um, it doesn't matter because there's not enough words for somebody to construct a language. I'm not I'm not doing Tolkien where there's enough words for people to really figure out how Quinian is spoken. Um, and to me, having a lot of words in another language can distract a reader, so I just don't really bother with it. Um, I'd rather cast the illusion than do all the work. And I'm also not a linguist. Like Tolkien, Tolkien was a genius when it came to linguistics and understanding languages, and that's not me. <laughs> um you know, I'm not a polyglot of dead languages like Tolkien was. So it's a little harder for me to create a made-up language when I don't know like 30 languages, right? Especially dead languages, which is what he knew. Um, he, he, was, he had a rare talent for that. And so the fact that it shows up in his books is really cool. But it's probably something that's, that's beyond my uh, capacity to do, uh, at least. I mean, I could convince some people, but probably not enough people. Um, Into the Spider-Verse is a grandiose yet personal story, and it takes advantage of a unique animation that's been given. I might check, I mean, I'm sure I'll check it out at least when it's on video. It's really hard for me to get out and, and see stuff. We're not even unpacked, you know. We moved into a new house, and we're not unpacked yet. Um, cartoon medium was typically only marketable to kids until Adult Swim came about. Probably Simpsons. Simpsons was the first... Um, the first show for adults that was uh, animated that I remember. But even, eh, that's not true. I'm lying. There was a movie called Heavy Metal. There's been adult cartoons, just not super popular in America um, until The Simpsons. Um, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla was on Christmas. What does Godzilla symbolize? Pre-war Japan or the U.S. military? It may have been deep. <laughs> Which Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla? Because there's the ori the real original one from the '70s, which is um, quite a quite a silly one. Um, and then there's another one that they made in the '80s, uh, or maybe it was the early '90s. Um, they had another Mechagodzilla. I think it was the one that came out before Godzilla versus Space Godzilla. Um, Godzilla originally symbolized um, the relate. You know, it, it had a symbolism relating to the atomic bomb. Um, later on, Godzilla's had different symbolism. So if you watch something like Shin Godzilla 
uh, I think it has a little bit different symbolism than just the atomic bomb. Uh, I think it has more to do with uh, like environmental symbolism or something like that. So it just depends on it. Um, I thought that like Mecha Godzilla was really, I mean, this is an interesting way to look at it. Is if Mecha Godzilla is the U.S. military, Japan is the echo of what the U.S. military did. It's the nuclear echo. Um, so in in other words. Mechagodzilla comes in to dominate Japan, to occupy Japan, and what fights Mechagodzilla is something that destroyed Japan, which is Godzilla, right? It fights something that really was created by, you know, the the nuclear force. So that's an interesting kind of symbolism. I don't know if I got that from the movie. I thought Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla is just a fun little, um, you know, fun little monster movie uh, in the Godzilla series, which I do kind of like the Godzilla movies. My son really likes them as well. Um, kids tend to really like monsters smashing giant buildings. So he'd be like, he's smashing the castle. And it's like, you know, there's a scene of him smashing a, like a model of Himiji castle or something. And, uh, I always like those personally. Um, maybe Japan is humble and highly intelligent and that's what makes them creative and their religion might help. You know, it, the thing is, is that if you look at them, if you look at them culturally, they're not, you wouldn't think that they're creative. Like they're very, this, you know, they're very homogenized. They're very homogenous. So you have a culture that's very he uh, heterogeneous in uh, in the West, in the United States, in Canada. You have uh, multiculturalism in a sense, and it produces the most bland garbage. But in a place where there's a homogenous culture, somehow there's way more experimentation and, and freedom. Um, my guess is they can look outward and inward. So when you're in your own homogenous culture, you can look out at Western culture and take what you want from it and know, have a good idea of how Japanese people are going to respond to it because, you know, they're rather homogenous, right? Um, whereas somebody in North Texas making a movie is going to make a movie that is for people in North Texas, but pretty much nowhere else. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you guys have been to North Texas, but it's a little different than California. Whereas people in California, this is why they're, we always feel like Hollywood's really out of touch, is they are out of touch. Hollywood is nothing like Texas. South Texas is nothing like North Texas or like East Texas. East Texas is where I'm from originally. And so if you go to East Texas, it's like going to a different country if you're from California. And so when I went there with my wife, she's like, this is everyone acts differently. Like they speak the same language. Everyone has a weird accent. There's completely different social idioms um, versus California. People are not, people are friendly in Texas. It's like everyone said hi to me and I was standing in line and someone just started having a conversation with me. It's like, we don't do that in California. Everybody is, stands in line and is just silent. And I think that's because there's, you know, there's, if, if you go to East Texas, there's still not a lot of um, Hispanic culture. It's almost all white and black, so it's less. Hom it's more homogenous culturally, and and so that lets people be more open and friendly. And if you go to Japan, people are actually very extroverted with each other, um, although it doesn't seem like it because it's so corporate. Uh, one of the things that everyone says if you go to Japan is is like you got to learn to be extroverted and and talk to people. They're actually really friendly and they will help you. <laughs> you know. And if you're from California, you're like, I could never talk to people, or if, especially in New York. New York's full of people that get angry at you. Um, for <laughs> if, you, if you're lost on the subway in New York, be prepared to be yelled at by somebody who thinks they're too good for any other person to be lost um, or who's never, never been in that situation. Anyway, I, I digress. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's um, – I don't think it has to do with intellect. And we can actually talk a little bit about intellect because Nassim Taleb had a very interesting um, thread on Twitter recently on IQ. And so I may spend some time talking about that in a noisy way. Um, I don't think it has to do with intellect. I think it probably has to do with the fact that their, you know, their culture values that in some way um, in their art. And they're able to look out and look in, um, which you can only do if you're in a homogenous culture. Um just a worrying if you go see Aquaman, the story is terribly predictable and cheesy. It's actually kind of structured like an old video game, but the visual and cinematography are gorgeous. That's what I expect out of Hollywood movies now. I expect a really cliche story that's very, very predictable and great visuals. Um, it's really rare that a story surprises me these days because I've seen so many. Um, 
And mostly I can just appreciate whether it's well executed or not, but usually you're looking at something that's that's pretty cliche and pretty on the nose um, as far as Hollywood goes. And that has to do with risk management. You have $200 million at stake. You got to do something. You, you can't risk people hating it. Um, you can only risk, you can risk people thinking it's okay, um, but you can't risk losing people on the plot or upsetting people. Um, so like if you were to have any of the SJW Marvel kind of stories from the last few years, um, regardless if you like them or not, um, they probably wouldn't do well in the box office because having like Captain America be part of Hydra would just upset too many people. They'd be upset by that plot twist. And um, even if it was creative or, or well done, um, they maybe not wouldn't go to the sequel because now they're their hero that they like is there's something bad done to them and and to a certain extent you can look at that with last jedi right like they threw they threw luke and they turned him into a, a bitter old man instead of a hero and that doesn't feel good to fans um maybe you could have taken a chance like that in like a one-off comic series that wasn't related to anything and seen how people reacted uh but chances are uh people get attached to these things and you don't want to just throw make a hero into a villain just because just because it's a twist um not necessarily a great decision um also there's a filter that keeps more crap local and allows more successful stuff to be accessed overseas but that goes both ways actually that is a great one so critical each japan says this yeah so there's a filtering mechanism right and it's the same filtering mechanism that happens with time the garbage is just forgotten the garbage is just you guys hear that engine that's my that's my neighbor he's got a loud he's got a rather he's got a rather large engine car i can usually tell which one it is he's got two that are pretty pretty loud and and crazy um so anyway so yeah the the crap that isn't successful in japan never makes it out but if i just look at the top 10 percent, let's look at the t top 10 percent. let's say everything that gets out of japan is like the top 10 percent in japan and you look at the top 10 percent of successful stuff in the, in the west there's no comparison the japanese stuff is like a hundred times more creative than what you get out of the west um so even looking at that filtering if we filter away the garbage then we still have more creativity coming out of Japan than the West. Um, and I see that with games, right? Look at the top 10% of games out of the West, and you'll realize like, oh my gosh, there's so little variety here. There's so little variety in gameplay, story. They look the same, you know? You go to the to Japan, and like one of the problems with Final Fantasy is every game's gotta do everything different. And so people are like, where's my classic gameplay? They're like, play Dragon Quest for your for your classic gameplay if you want something new and original you do final fantasy so every single final fantasy game has like new aesthetics and weird new stuff um and that's that's great I, like there's a there's it's it's awesome um but yeah that filtering does go both ways they only see the good stuff here but i think the good stuff here is worse or the I mean, not necessarily worse it's less explosively creative than the good stuff in japan um Oh yeah, anime, yeah, this is a great point by Ian Hollis. Anime is always widely marketed to a wide variety of ages. Totally. Um, I remember watching the original eight-man cartoon, the black and white one. You guys probably don't remember that one. Um, uh, on TV years ago, like in the 80s. Um, what used to happen is the West would pull these anime shows in like Voltron. If you know what Voltron is, Voltron was two different anime series. They got cut up and readapted with different stories for whatever reason when they brought them to the West. Um, and uh, that's that was something that, that happened all the time. It was like something cool would happen in Japan or they'd look at an animation like, what if we just overdub this and like cut it up and just make a new thing with it? Power Rangers is actually a Japanese show that they shoot all they every all the battles are from the Japanese show and then the the actors are 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 new. So the actors don't actually do any of the battle stuff. They just stand around and talk and then you see battle scenes, which is because they have a mask where you can't see their face. They just not, you know. Um so the West has been doing that for a long time. Um Vampire Hunter D was one of the first I remember that was like explicitly an adult anime that was very bloody and um that anime actually had a big impact on me creatively uh because it was so weird and so creative it's had this like sci-fi vampire future vampires rule the earth thing and then um you know so uh, akira 
of course, which is very influential. These things are, are not for kids, but that's coming from a culture that is just different and didn't didn't have the same things that like cartoons are just for kids. Maybe they were influenced by Western animation um, earlier, but then they did their own thing with it. And so that's kind of cool. Uh, but that's I think that's always been like a niche thing um, compared to the mainstream animation in the 80s. Um, thanks for making these videos. They're a great tools for storytelling and entertaining. I appreciate that um, and I like making them. Um, how to make larger than life characters without being unrealistic and annoying or overpowered. What makes an extraordinary character um, feel real? I'm sick of everyman characters. So uh, this will be the last question I can answer because I, although I started late, I got to go. So I'm going to answer this question and then I'll I'll wrap up. We'll talk about pub, we'll talk about publishing in a different stream or a different video. Um, how to make a larger than life characters without being unrealistic and annoying or overpowered. So the easiest thing is to think about yourself or people that you know. But yourself is easy because you know yourself the best. So if you think about yourself, think about the thing that you're best at. Maybe it's fixing cars. Maybe it's writing. Maybe it's doing something else. And imagine that you were like the best at that thing in the world. And imagine that if only the only thing that people saw was you being good at that, they would think of you as a superhero, right? And so that's that's what we really see with superheroes is that we see their powers and it, what goes past their powers that becomes their interesting part. So if you're really good at fixing cars, you may be really bad at mowing lawns or, you know, figuring out how to like grow flowers. Who knows? Uh, you may be bad at something else. So the way that you keep a, a larger than life character down to earth is you make it a point to show those things, which that person is normal at. So, um, if you have a, you know, if you have a super powerful character, that's like, incredibly strong and wields a gigantic axe um like a conan like character or something well then you need to see that character having some sort of regular human interaction being jealous being angry not being able to do something not knowing how to make a horse do what he wants um, those are all things which humanize characters um, so they can be really overpowered like conan the barbarian is very overpowered but um he also, you know, isn't isn't necessarily like the smartest person. Um, so you you have to think about the normal things that everybody has to do, which are you're not the best at. So if you're the best car mechanic in the world, you may still be really bad at doing your taxes. So if you make it a point to show that, then people don't think that you're some sort of Mary Sue that can just fix anything. It's like he can fix anything, but he can't do his taxes, or he can fix anything, but he can't talk to girls. Um, these are these are the things that make. Uh, make characters human um, and make them feel real is seeing those moments. So this is something that you'll see in, in a lot of superhero movies um, and you see them in superhero comics especially and Stan Lee made a point of doing that um, and he did it mostly with humor. So he would he would have the, the character do something funny or embarrassing that would just show you that that character has flaws, that they're human, that they're not perfect at everything. So someone like Peter Parker who is Spider-Man. He has spider powers and he's a very smart guy. But maybe he misses the mark with girls or you know, he he still struggles to to keep his business going whatever it is depending on where he is like if it's the photography thing or like you know, you show him you show him being late to work and getting in trouble and that's something that we all maybe have, have felt at one point we've messed up at work and gotten chastised by the boss. So having those moments dropped in, which Stanley was very good at doing, um, humanizes the characters. And in fact, that's one of the probably one of the best contributions he made is not thinking up characters with powers, but being able to show them being human um, and being relatable and being likable and uh, and all of those all of those little things that make a character. Um, have an attachment or make a reader have an attachment to a character. So that's probably what I would do is make sure you have some scenes where the person it fails at something. They don't know how to, there's something they don't know how to do uh, and they have to ask for help or maybe they're really proud and they have to ask for help and then that's an even more humbling thing. So that's um, that's what I'll say with this. I'm sorry that the stream has been a little bit short. Um, 
<laughs> yes, Peter Parker is is Spider Man. Um, every hard gangster on Sopranos had a normal life. Yeah, they had a family that they cared about. They had a family. They had a wife that they had trouble getting along with. Those are all things that keep you grounded and make and make the character more sympathetic too. So anyway, guys, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Um, stream is going to happen every Wednesday, 6, 6 Pacific, 9 Eastern. Um, I'm going to try to keep this going as long as I can. Sorry it was late today, but we've got the holidays and other things going on. So I'll see you next time. And uh, don't forget to check out my books at dvspress.com. You can find other stuff at davidvstewart.com. And I will... Um, I'll try to respond to your emails. Email me at stu at davidvstuart.com. Um, and I'll see you guys next time.